Well, thank you for joining me for the next uh, few minutes, a little shorter than usual as we look at what we're going to be discussing and looking at and participating on on Sunday. We have a big Sunday planned for you. Um, and also to honor the Lord, we're going to have a couple that we're welcoming into membership. We're going to discuss a little bit about what membership is, not here today on the video, but on Sunday. We're also going to have an interview with uh, a man by the name of John Martin. Most of you are probably know who he is and what he's been through over the last handful of weeks. We'll be interviewing him and see what God is doing in his life, do a little bit of an update of how things are going and what God has taught him and others around him. But we also are going to spend a good significant portion uh, dedicating three children unto the Lord on, on Sunday from three different families. And so what I'm going to do, we're going to, just going to discuss for the next few minutes um, what it means to dedicate your children to the Lord. Now, before I get into the text and look at the scripture for some examples, I hope you've been jumping on our website at www.myfaithchurch.org, clicking the resource tab. There's a number of things that you can download, whether it's Right Now Media or instructions to download the YouVersion Bible app uh, in order to receive some text alerts uh, from our church, and they will come in handy, especially on Sunday as we're planning to have an all-church pool celebration and a baptism as well. And as you look at the weather, we may run into some weather issues. So I strongly encourage you to text My Faith Church. that's one word, to 888-403-4294. You will receive some just important text alerts uh, regarding our church as well, some reinforcement of some material that comes out on Monday. Uh, that will help you to sort of reinforce what you learn, what we've looked at on Sunday. Thank you as well for getting on our website, clicking the donate button or contributing or contributing. How about contributing uh, to um, uh, the work of Faith Church and what we do by texting 73256, your contribution. So no further ado, we're going to jump in and look at the biblical view of what child dedication is. Why do we do this? Um, it seems a little odd if you've never experienced for we drag a, a family up and they have their child and I pray over them. And, and what in the world is this all about? Now, some of you may, because of your background, uh, be, may, may be familiar with infant baptism. Why don't we, we do that? Uh, well, the reason why we, we don't, and this is not to disparage anybody's tradition or, or, or anything like that, but we see a biblical model of baby dedication or child dedication, sometimes even entire households being dedicated unto the Lord. We do see entire families in the scripture being baptized, but mostly what we see uh, are believers that are baptized, um, people who have professed faith, and then after that is a demonstration of their faith that they've already received in a public way, um, baptized and uh, have be baptized unto unto the Lord. And we do see entire households, but there's no mentions of mention of infants in those in those households. And what we see is that there is a profession of faith and then there is an outward expression of that in baptism. But we do have a number of examples of what it means to dedicate children unto the Lord. And it's really more about not so much the child or the infant, but really about the parent, the commitment that they are making unto the Lord. And there's just several examples. And probably the most dominant one that we look at and the most strong one is, is Jesus. I mean, Mary and Joseph at eight days old, he they went to the temple and the high priest, uh, there was a prophecy that there was something special about that. We, we see this with in the Old Testament with Samuel and, and Hannah. Uh, and we're going to look at that passage of scripture just briefly here. Um, we see it with Isaac and Abraham and we see it with Samson and his and his parents. We see it just in a number of different places where parents make a commitment unto the Lord to raise their child in the ways of the Lord. Now, what we're going to do here, just briefly, I'm going to read three passages of scripture or three accounts that have to do with three sets of parents and children. And I'm just going to do it really briefly. But what's unique about these three passages is that they're all contemporaries 
of one another. That means they lived in the same time. Two of the stories, or two of the accounts, actually their paths cross. One, the last one, is, does not, but he lives in the same time. The three passages that we're going to look at is uh, Hannah and, Sa and Samuel, uh, and also the story of Eli. If you're not familiar with Eli, he was the high priest during the time when Samuel was born. And Eli's sons, if you're not familiar with the story of Hannah and Samuel, I'll give you a little bit of a background in just a moment. And then also the third one, who is a contemporary, but his story does not necessarily, their paths do not cross, is, is Samson. I'm sure you're familiar with him and, and his parents. Now, if you have your Bible, you can jump in. We're going to go to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1. This is really where we see uh, the accounts not only of Hannah and, and Samuel, but also um, uh, Eli and, and his sons as well. Now, a little bit of a background. Uh, Hannah was married to a man by the name of Elkanah. Elkanah was also married to a woman by the name, not just of Hannah, he had two wives, but Penina. And it is obviously not an ideal situation. The culture has creeped in. And whenever you see in the Old Testament, especially when God doesn't come right out and say, it's not a good idea to have more than one wife. Usually we see by example, right? By the, the, the thing that we're looking at, it never works out good. Now, later on, God would say, man with, with one wife, this is the way it's supposed to be. But we see this non-idyllic situation. They all have disappointments in their relationship. Elkanah loved Hannah, but could not give her a child. Uh, Hannah loved her husband, but really wanted a child. And we see that Penina could have children, but she was not as loved as Hannah was. And so she took out her disappointment in life on Hannah, made life very miserable for her. There was one particular occasion where Hannah is so distraught and she's praying before the Lord. This is in 1 Samuel chapter 1. And Eli, who is the high priest ministering before the Lord at that time, this older man at this time, sees her lips moving, assumes that she's drunk. That's kind of a sign of the time. You can be drunk in the temple, right? Goes to her to confront her and Hannah says, no, I'm pouring out my heart to the Lord. She also pours out her heart to Eli. And Eli says, the Lord has heard your request. Hannah washes her face. She has joy come back into her life. Even before God's promise is necessarily delivered, she's going to live in the light of the joy that she has found in the Lord, not just in the promise of what she's received. Now, eventually she gives birth. And after a while, she has promised that she's going to give this child, Samuel is his name, back unto the Lord. And we're going to pick up the account here. This is starting in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 21. When her husband Elkanah went up with his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, after the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord and he will live there always. This was what she said. He will be given unto the Lord's service. Now, God is not telling us all that your children at the age of four or whatever, or whatever have to, you have to go live with the pastor at the church. This is not what this means. There's some symbolic stuff going on here. But in those days, she was going to give him unto the Lord. And this is for her. This is what this meant. She was going to fulfill her vow. Her husband says, do what's best, what seems best to you. Stay here until you've weaned him. Only make good what the Lord's word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. After he was weaned, she took the boy, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. When the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli, and she said to him, Pardon me, my Lord, as surely as you live. I am the woman who stood before you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me him. I now give him to the Lord for his whole life. He will be given over to the Lord. And they worshiped, he worshiped the Lord there. Now, many of you are probably familiar with this passage of Scripture. She found joy in the Lord, not in her son. Even though she loved her son, she loved the Lord. She allowed others, like Eli, to pour into the life of her son. She raised her son well, even though 
she did have limited contact with her son. And if you're familiar with Samuel, he's one of the great examples in the scripture of just a consistent life. His entire life, there's not a dark chapter in his life in terms of doing something wrong or walking away from the Lord. He was just solid. He was consistent. He was just one of those guys. The scripture actually doesn't record any miracles that Samuel did. He never really traveled very much farther than where he was born and where he served in the temple. He just ministered to people. He eventually would take Eli's place. And he is just considered one of the staples. If you're a Jewish person or if you're a Christian uh, person who has a tremendous respect for the Old Testament, he is just a solid, solid character, hero. In fact, in the New Testament, you often see Samuel. Uh, his name is mentioned, you know. And so even though he doesn't perform these miracles and he didn't travel very far and doesn't have a, his, his resume was just consistent. He took what, from, what he had from his mother. He took as well what he learned from Eli and he implemented it into his life. Now, let's kind of get a little picture of Eli. I already mentioned him. He was the high priest. Um, and Eli was not a good father. Um, he had a godly heritage in his life and he had sons. He passed on that heritage because his sons followed in the family business. But he did not raise them in a godly way. And he eventually is judged for that. And the Lord tells him this is why. In fact, in the passage of scripture that we're going to read here, the only time that we actually see Eli interceding in the behavior of his sons, and they're older at this time, they're out of the house in a sense, is when their behavior starts to reflect upon him. And in many ways, I think the... The failure that Eli knew with his sons, he tried to make up for it in investing in the life of Samuel. And so we have this account here in 1 Samuel chapter 3, starting in verse 22. Let me read this as well. Now Eli, who was very old, heard about everything that his sons were doing to all Israel. They were priests as well. It was a family business, but they were corrupt how they slept with the women who served in the entrance of the tent of meeting. And if we would continue to read, they also were very, they, they stole, they took more than they ought to of the offering. So they're taking advantage of people. And so he said to him, why do you do such things? This is Eli talking to his sons. I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. No, my sons, the report I hear spreading among the Lord's people is not good. You know, he is a little too late. And the only time he really intercedes is when it starts to reflect poorly upon him. If one person sins against another, God may mediate for the offender. But if anyone sins against God, who will intercede for them? His sons, however, did not listen to their father's rebuke, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. It wasn't that the Lord didn't love them. Their names are Hophni and Phineas, But... They had reached a point in their life where they did not care. They were, they, were, they were as far away from God as they possibly could, and they were riding on their father's coattails. Uh, they were evil men. And then verse 26 says this, The boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with people, and that is reflective of Luke chapter 2, 52, the description of Jesus. And so we have this dichotomy that is being presented here in the scripture. We have Eli's sons and we have Samuel. And so here in this passage of scripture, it is clear in other places as well that Eli, even though he had a godly heritage and he passed on some traditions to his children, they followed even in the family business. He did a poor job of raising his own kids in the ways of the Lord. And eventually on a very dark day, his sons die. And when Eli receives news of his son's death, he dies as well. The family line is broken. Samuel becomes the high priest at this point. Sad story. Very different than Samuel's story, who had Hannah as a godly parent. Now here's the third passage of scripture. It's found in the book of Judges. And begin reading here in verse 2 of chapter 13. This is Samson. And if you're not familiar with Samson, he... He's known for his strong muscles, but yet he had a very weak character most of his life. 
Uh, he just resisted the Lord. The Lord used him, but it was never really in connection with Samson's will. The Lord just used him. And yet we see that Samson's parents are held in high regard. They're known as righteous people. They were involved in his life. They raised him the right way. But yet most of the time, Samson just did his own thing. Let me read starting in verse 2, chapter 13. A certain man from Zora named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was childless. And there's this pattern here. She's barren as well. Unable to give birth, the angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are barren and childless, but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine, other from a drink, and that you do not any, eat anything unclean. Desperate times call for desperate measures. So they were living in the time of the judges, a very dark period. The theme was everyone just did what was right in their own eyes. They didn't have any regard for God or his standards. And yet here we have Samson's parents a bright light in a dark in a dark time. Angel Lord says to her, you will become pregnant in a son uh, uh, whose head is never to be touched by a razor. That's his hair, right? Because his boy is to be a Nazarite. This is this vow. We don't have time here today to talk about what this means. It's, a, it's an outward act of an inward commitment. That's what it's supposed to be. Dedicated to God from the womb. And he will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. And he did. God used him, but it was never really in connection with the heart of Samson. Then the woman went to her husband and told him, a man of God came to me. He looked like an angel of God, very awesome. I didn't ask him uh, from where he came, and he didn't tell me his name, but he said to me, you'll become pregnant and have a son. Now then drink no wine or other fermented drink and do not eat anything unclean because the boy will be a Nazarite of God from the womb until the day of his death. And Manoah prayed to the Lord, or I prayed to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord, I beg you to let the man of God you sent come to us again to teach us how to bring up the boy who was to be born. As far as we know, and the scripture I think confirms this, Samson's parents raised him in this commitment, told him and taught him the things of the Lord. And yet the first shot the first really step into adulthood, we see Samson going down to a Philistine city, gets involved with a Philistine woman, not Delilah, that's going to be 20 years later. He's got a pattern in his life. He has a type, doesn't he? And he's intent on marrying her. And again, here's parents, they come in, and we won't read this passage of scripture, and they said, what are you doing? You're not raised this way. You're not to be this kind of person. He shrugs them off, and there's a whole mess, and we won't even get into that. And there's more mess, and there's more more verses that are dedicated to the mess that Samson makes of his life. We have godly parents who raised him in a godly way. And yet it is the responsibility of a child to accept and adhere to that. Now, here's some observations from those three passages of Scripture. I'm going to go rather quickly. Number one is this. Hannah was a godly parent, and Samuel was a godly man. In this case, everything flowed the way it ought to, right? Number two, Eli was a poor parent, and his parent and his sons were very ungodly men. Kind of makes sense, kind of flows in what you would expect. And now it gets a little difficult, a little, a little bit, okay. Samson's parents were godly, and yet Samson, for most of his life, was not. Until the very end, he, he was not a godly man. Now, here's a little other added thing. We actually see that Samuel was a godly man, and yet his sons were not godly. And I didn't even read that passage of Scripture, and yet none of the judgment comes upon Samuel. And you'd expect that to be. God would be consistent. If he judged Eli, the high priest, as being a poor parent, he would judge Samuel. And so what we kind of affirm or you know see in the Scripture is that Samuel never receives blame for his sons making these poor choices. Now, here's some applications that we see from all this. Number one is this. Your role as a parent is to raise your children in the way of the Lord, period. If you don't do it, that hole will be filled. It will be filled by YouTube or TikTok or, or whatever else, and this is nothing new. The culture will always fill the void that you leave. 
And so these three couples that are bringing these three children, they happen to be all girls here on this on the Sunday that we're going to be looking at in the next couple of days. Um, they're going to be making a commitment to raise their children in the ways of the Lord. This does not mean that this is going to secure their, these child's salvations. That's not what we're doing. And it's not even a guarantee that there's not going to be times when they don't rebel or even reject. But their job is to raise their children in the ways of the Lord. Here's number two. Your godly parenting, it's not a guarantee that your children will ultimately decide to follow the Lord, but you greatly increase their chances. You're stacking the deck in their favor. You know this. If you have children, if they're, if they're older, and especially if they're out of the house, you want to give the best opportunity for your children to make the best choices. But ultimately, it does come down to them. This is about free will. And fortunately, there are people that I know that had very ungodly parents. And yet, by the grace of God, because God's grace is always greater than the poor example of poor parenting, they found the Lord and they broke that cycle. If we think that this is something that perfect parents produce perfect children, that is not what we see in the scripture. We see that Samson's parents were godly. We see that Samuel was godly. Their children just made poor choices. But we greatly increase the chances. We're not going to be poor examples on purpose because we don't think that it matters. And if you think that that's the case, here's number three. Ungodly parenting or passive parent or passive spiritual aid parenting, it's costly. If you happen to be a, a parent and you know you were not a good parent, and yet for however some reason you're you have a child that just grabbed a hold of the things of God and and in spite of your poor example, you don't you don't get a pass. You will still be held accountable for your actions or your lack of actions in spite of how your children have turned out. Now, most of the time, what happens is when you have a bad example and you don't parent correctly, your children are going to follow suit. You will still be held, obviously, responsible for that. But thank God, God's grace is greater than the examples at times. And I've seen this. Parents who do not do a good job, not even believers, and yet God's grace reaches down into individuals and grabs a hold of them, and their past is not a blueprint or a pattern that is set for life because God is the chain breaker. Now, what we're going to do with these three couples, we're going to bring them up, we're going to pray over their children, and they're going to make a public commitment to raise their children in the ways of the Lord. And not only that, but as a church, we're going to respond with our part in the same way as Eli even though he was not the biological parent of Samuel, he did pour into the life of Samuel. He did, even though he did not do that with his own children. As a church, we are to pour into their lives as well. And whatever that means, whether that's giving or whether that's teaching a Sunday school class or whether that's just being involved in the web of, of relationships that you get sort of organically when you're involved in a fellowship with believers. And that is what we're going to do on Sunday. We hope that you can join us in person. If not, I hope you get a, a good picture here today of what child dedication means. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you strength. God bless.